Um, welcome to this webinar dealing with mesoscale microscale coping for a wound resource assessment. Also, this webinar is a dissemination activity of those within the European Commission project Enersico, funded under the H2020 program. So my name is Daniel Paredes, and I'll be your host in this webinar. I'm head of innovation for uh, the Energy Resource Department in Iberdrola Renewables. And my company is part of this project together with Barcelona Super Computing Center and CMA. So first of all, a few considerations. Please uh, keep your microphones muted and web web webcams turned off, okay? After the presentations, questions from the audience can be sent via the chat or raising the hand icon that you will find in the screen if you find it, because in my case, for instance, I, I can't find it, but you can use the, you can use the chat to, to send a question and I'll uh, read it out loud, okay? Also, we inform you that the session will be recorded. So the webinar is organized in two sections. First, there will be uh, three presentations on different techniques and aspects of meso micro coupling. And after, there will be a panel discussion with five experts in wind resource and wind modeling. Each presentation will take around 20 minutes. And there will be around extra 10 minutes for questions from, from the audience, depending on the length of the presentations. Okay? So you're welcome to send your questions through the chat or raising your hand in the, in the interface, okay? So as a brief introduction to the project, NERSICO is a Europe-Mexico collaboration that aims to develop performance simulation tools that require exascale HPC and data-intensive algorithms for different energy sources. Among them is uh, wind energy production. So our work is being developed within the World Package 2 and fundamentally aims to develop a dynamical mesoscale microscale coupling for both RANS and LES models. Probably our first presenter can, can tell you more about this. The first presentation is uh, titled on the coupling of meso microscale models by means of forcing terms in a SQL experience. And the presenter is Oriol Lenkul who is a senior researcher at the Department of Computer Applications in Science and Engineering of uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. He holds a PhD in Mechanical Engineering in the area of Computational Fluid Dynamics and is a Ramon Cajal researcher and leads the Large Scale Computational Fluid Dynamics Group in BSC. So his main research interests are related to turbulence modeling, uh, multi-phase modeling, high performance computing, multi-physics and multi-scale modeling, aerodynamic simulations and biomechanical model. So, uh, Oriol, uh, your turn. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I'm going to share the, the screen. And well, in principle, uh, what we're going to do is a summary of the activities we're doing at World Package 2 of Energico where we are trying to build a couple of microscale models. And of course, this is activity of the, all the work package. Uh, you can see some the, the people has been contributing here. I'm going to present and I'm going to focus on our side that it's more the computational fluid dynamics part and how we couple meso microscale because it's the part I'm more comfortable, but I'm going to explain a little bit the overall picture. So, <clears throat> The, the motivation, uh, I put here a motivation, we can find hundreds of other wind fans where we see the same problems, no? where you work with Iberdrola, we, we have a, a long-term collaboration with Iberdrola. And here I'm, I'm using an example from Mexico that it's appropriate for the, the project uh, in uh, It's It's a wind farm uh, located on Puebla. And we know that when you do a simulation of this wind farm with neutral conditions, so just a microscale simulation, uh, you have big deviations uh, over the observed uh, wind profiles at different masts inside the, the, the wind farm. So you can see here in, in red, well, is the kind of pink uh, the, for different mast values of uh, speed ups, no? Uh, compared with the observations that is in gray. Eh? And you see that there are big differences when you look for the bias, uh, you, we, we can uh, note very large errors. And on this particular word, this is a word from some of my colleagues at, uh, the, at BSC, where they were trying for this particular case, they were doing a, a, 
a diagonal circle uh, uh, cycle simulation using stability uh, theory. And then they were able to, to simulate uh, this, the same wind farm, but taking in consideration the, the stability conditions and the diagonal uh, cycle. And then you can see in, in, in blue the difference in results. Okay, It's a, a big improvement. However, the way that this was done, it was very particular to the, the, this particular case. It was not general. But for us, it was an indication that it's very good, no? If we can begin to have a model where we couple the different scales that are interacting on the atmosphere in order to have predictive uh, and more robust methods for wind resource assessment at the looking the wind farms, no? And is in this in this uh, framework where uh, we are working on Energico, and on Energico from you know we have several scales from the global scale to the scale at the at the airfoil of the wind turbine no uh, we are talking about you can see here very very different uh, length scales so on on energico we are focusing trying to couple the meso scale and the micro scale uh, with the hope that then we can have a more predictive uh, wind resource assessment methodology of course more expensive and one of the things that we need to understand is how this is why is this is more expensive if the cost that we are assuming makes sense uh, when we compare with the observations and then there is a, a real benefit uh, of using those models that are trying to couple all these type of scales of course the dream will be to couple everything and then have something very similar to reality but this is still very long uh, if you do some calculations, I'm going to give you some calculations because Energico as well is targeting to, to have technology that is going to be used on exascale machines. No, no, not necessarily on the machines that we have now. So in the machines we will have in uh, depends Europe or the States, etc. But let's say in three, four years that we will have uh, and we will be able to access. So in our case, uh, I'm going to show you after some simulation using LES coupled with WORF with our solver Alia. And we can run one day in one uh, day of simulation time using 2000 CPUs. So this means that if we would like to run a, a year, and we, there is another factor as well, that we need several hours of this simulation in order to accommodate all the turbulence in order to uh, have some initial fields that are really turbulent. So usually we say that we need at the end two days, no? because we need to simulate two days in order to have one good day, the, the, the final day. So with 2000 CPUs. So the, the idea then is that if we want to simulate one year, that usually at least you need to simulate one year to have an estimation of the energy that you will get from a particular site, right? So uh, we can do similar to what uh, people when use WORF does, no? that you simulate several days and couple in order to avoid drifting on the boundary conditions. So imagine that we do these couples in two days and two days and two days, we can do in parallel, uh, all, all the different days. And, and then uh, you see that you need order of hundreds of CPUs in order to be able to run this, this, uh, this, this particular uh, days, no? in, let's say, in less of, than a week. Okay? So this means that this is a very big simulation where maybe you are using the current biggest uh, machine that we have on Spain, all the all the machine, all Mare Nostrum 4, just to do that during several days. And then at the end, you will have your approximation of one year. So this is a very big simulation uh, that could be uh, a particular large scale uh, simulation on the next uh, exascale machines, okay? So it's a very interesting, uh, uh, thing to research, but of course it's not very useful at this moment. No, so in order to have something in the middle where we begin to study all these techniques, 
and um, we, we can do these projections thinking on, okay, uh, we are going to need uh, several days with, I don't know, maybe 500,000 CPUs altogether to, to get this one year simulation. Um, so, but we can as well begin to, to think on how to use this with the current supercomputers uh, to help uh, industry like Iberdrola. And this was a little bit the idea of Energico. But we were having two activities. The, the first activity is led by CMAT, where they are doing classification of different wind conditions, but trying to classificate in terms of the source terms that we need uh, in order to do this coupling. Okay. So they, they, they have developed, I'm not going to show, but if people is interested, they can contact us. I'm sure that uh, people from CMAT, they are going to, to, to give more details on that, and we will have papers on at the end of the project, we, we have still uh, six months of, of project. And uh, they have developed a way where uh, from a particular year, you can do a classification of the most similar days that they have the most similar type of, of forcing terms. And then from that, you can reconstruct uh, some particular, let's say, A days for that are representative of all the year when they can consideration the the, the, the coupling between the mesoscale and the microscale. And then instead of running all the 300 and something days, you just need to run um, these nine, eight days. And after you can scale your results and you can reconstruct uh, the final behavior of this year, taking in consideration the substance between the, 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 the different uh, meso and microscale. Okay, what we have been developing at BSC, I'm going to show more details on, on, on that aspect, is how we should couple the mesoscale and the microscale, taking in consideration our alias and run solvers, okay? And finally, we want to combine everything to have full validation of this methodology, comparing our results with the results that Iberdrola has on field. And this is going to be done on this last part of the project, where we are going to target the same uh, wind farm of Mexico, Puebla, and we are going to see if now we can have a more automatic way to be able to, to reproduce the, the observation. Okay, as I was telling, I'm going to focus on, on the coupling, explain our experience, our problems mainly. I, I will talk a lot of the problems that we have and the first conclusions that we are having uh, on some particular benchmark that we are targeting. So the idea, I put here some equations. This is more runs to d but it doesn't matter because we are talking about the, the coupling and you will see the coupling is the same. And not, it doesn't matter if you do runs or LES. The idea is that we introduce some advection and some pressure gradient terms that they come from the mesoscale simulation. You could use WARF, you could use uh, ERA5 also in order to reconstruct those terms. And we have an advection term as well for the temperature. Okay. In addition, we need information of the temperature at the surface of the of the of the terrain, and you can as well uh, use nudging for some of the of the for the velocities and the temperature. We have been experimenting with the nudging, um, and at this moment we we don't have a, a, a clear. Um, you know, opinion. So we, we have uh, done some simulation with nudging and without nudging, and we don't see a big improvements on the on the results. Okay, but this is something we are studying um, how how to do this nudging in order to avoid some drifting from the WARF uh, predictions, especially in the top of the domain of our micro scale simulation. Okay, so you can see these terms come from a very coarse uh, WARF simulation, usually. For instance, three kilometers by three kilometers, it's the, the grid that the world domain is doing. And then we do averages of these terms uh, for each eight. Uh, so uh, depending the, the terrain, we have constant planes for each eight of uh, constant advection and gradients of pressure that is changing just on time and it's changing on the, on the vertical uh, direction. Okay, we have as well play on different ways to do this averaging. And, and in principle, it's not a, a, at this moment, 
because we are using this technique that it's not really a 3D tendency, it's just one dimensional and it changes on time. There is no too much effect on the way that we do this averaging. Okay, so there is another problem is that how we couple in the sense that how we define our, our domains and after how we do this effective coupling between the, the two solvers. Uh, there is one first possible option that is to have a precursor that has been already coupled with WORF. Precursor is just a one dimensional code that it's all periodic and then you introduce these source terms and you get some profiles and you use those profiles on the inlet uh, of your domain and you are changing these profiles over all your simulation. Okay, there are some uh, specific challenges. So if you, do, if you use runs, in principle, uh, the, the, the challenge uh, that I'm going to explain is more on the, on the next slide. In principle, everything sounds very good. You can use a reduced domain. Uh, you can impose here your one-dimensional profiles. And if you have enough, um, a little bit of buffer zone, the flow is going to accommodate and you are going to have then inside something that is following the the, the forcing from from Worf, no? However, if you are using LES, then you need to transition from this one dimensional type of profile to something that it's turbulent, okay? It's true that you could use a, a 3D precursor as well and do like an external LES domain, but then the cost of this method begins to be higher and higher, no? So how you do this triggering of the turbulence is a, a, a as well a complex problem and which distance you need to, to solve that, it's as well a complex problem. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a more, uh, in principle, looks like a, a better approach. The problem that you can find is that if you look at the profiles that you have, this is the plane of the inlet. So this is this plane for a run simulation. This is the plane and we can, you, you can see some profiles as well. So these are some profiles here in order that you, you get a, a better understanding. Uh, this is for the wind direction, for the wind speed, and for the particular velocity in the string waves uh, direction. And you can see uh, that you have negative velocity. So the profile enters, goes outside the domain and enters on the domain. So this is a very ill uh, poison problem. So uh, Usually you want to have inlets that are really inlets, you want to have outlets that are really outlets. And, you, and if you have planes like this, that in between there is some part that is gained out, other parts that are gained in, usually this gives very, very bad numerical uh, behaviors and it's a very tough problem to stabilize. And uh, my colleague, Matthias Avila, the, the, the senior researcher that is working on runs on, on my group, has been working very tough with different strategies, numerical strategies to stabilize that. And at the end, we see that uh, you, you change a lot the pressure, then you see effects on the pressure that is affecting the, the overall domain. And it's a bad strategy, at least when you use RAND. And we believe that for LES as well, okay? Although we have not tried with LES, but uh, fundamentally it's the, the best, the, the same type of uh, numerics at the end. There are, of course, nuances. But you will see the same problems, very much related with the pressure equation, the, the, the incompressibility, uh, Laplace and pressure equation we need to solve, and how it's interacting with this inlet outlet region. No? So uh, another option that is the one that the end we are using on, on Energico is to use periodic uh, conditions. So you have your domain, and then for each of these worlds, you do a periodic condition, OK? And you introduce the source terms inside your, 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 your domain. And this naturally is going to drive uh, the turbulence. The turbulence naturally is going to be driven. And then you will have some uh, more some sustained turbulence inside the domain that is going to be changing following the source terms. Okay, you will see that the wind direction changes a lot. I'm going to show some videos after. And this is self-contained when you use this type of periodic boundary conditions. The problem is that since you are using periodic conditions, you need to accommodate this topography with this topography, okay? And the same for the other uh, lateral parts. So usually you need to enlarge the geometry and you, you need to do a compatible geometry from one side to the other. Doing that, you are generating 
you are doing alterations of the topography that can generate uh, fictitious wakes, can generate fictitious acceleration inside your domain, and this could give you uh, uh, the wrong uh, predictions at the end as well. So how you do that, how big you need to do the domain in order to try to um, reduce this problem uh, as much as possible, etc. It's an open question that we're still researching. I, I know there are other groups doing similar approach and they are as well uh, uh, researching on that, okay? But it's, this is very consistent. This is a, a, a video for today's, I think this is uh, about today's, and you can see how the turbulence at the beginning is generated, and depending if you are at the night, you have these more bigger stratified structures. When you are at the noon, then you have very convective uh, patterns uh, that depend on the on the um, on the smallest scales. This is a particular test case from Alais I'm going to show after that we, we are following. And uh, we have a mountain, a valley, we have another mountain here. And you can see that the wind direction is changing all the time. And this is because we are following the, the mesoscale tendencies, OK? So uh, it's more robust to use this periodic uh, domain. But the problem that you can find is that then you can have these effects. So here I'm, I'm using temperature because temperature is very nice to track uh, some of the wakes that are generated on the, on the flow. Uh, we are looking at the temperature at, I think, about 100 meters, 100 meters. Sorry, uh, uh, Oriol, yeah. we have a, a couple, three minutes left, OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About uh, 100 meters above the, the terrain. And then you can see that there are clearly effects that this weight that is generated by this mountain is entering on the domain. So now the strategies that we are following is to rotate the domain. And then this weight that is going to generate its generated heat is going to enter by this this part, okay? And after this wake is going to go there and the, and there, so there is more time in order the wake to travel and and to and to mix with the rest of the of the flow. And we hope that this strategy then it's more robust. We are running some cases with that. Unfortunately, uh, we 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 didn't make it in order to show some results with that here. So I'm going to, to show some specific um, uh, validations. Uh, we have been doing validations on this uh, EIA task uh, 31. This is an activity led by uh, Javier Sanz that is as well here. It has been a very nice activity for us to, to use this method to see how was working our method in comparison with other codes. I'm going just to show our, our uh, results. OK, but uh, there is a paper coming from this activity. If people is interested, please look for that. And uh, you will see there is uh, a lot of cross validation. Uh, and, and we can see the weakness of our approach and, and for which part it's, it's better. No? So we are simulating uh, four days. And these are uh, the observations of the for the wind speed. So you can see that there are several big changes on the on the wind speed as well, several phases. Okay, uh, we have some videos as well. These are some visualization of the initial part of the simulation. You can see we go on the night, everything is is very laminar, and then over the day it gets very turbulent, and then uh, you you have this cycle that it. Uh, follow it by our simulation. This is Elias. First, we have done some validation just with. Uh, plain terrain, comparing the precursor coupled with Wolf, uh, the runs, the Alia runs uh, model, and the Elias model, the, the one that we have on Alia. And we can see that we have very similar velocity profiles, temperature profile, and, and with the speed direction. So this was very good for the previous validation. And then we have compared the runs and the Elias solver on the, on the regions of allies where uh, the wind farm is located. You can see here for the first two days the, the comparison between class and, and runs. Uh, we follow very much. There is not that much difference between the turbulence model. And everything looks very driven by the by the mesoscale part uh, of the simulations. And we have looked as well inside the valley. Here we have a valley. So we I can show as well some values inside the valley. Inside the valley, it looks that LES is doing a little bit better the work. But uh, even everything is very similar. What it's important to say as well, that if you're launching, you don't look just the first two days, you look 
the, the, the four days, the full four days, then we begin to see uh, shiftings uh, drift, uh, on our solutions, okay? It's more apparent on the wind farm, not that much on the inside the, the valley. And now we are uh, trying to study why this is the case, okay? If this, the, this is the case because we need to restart the boundary conditions uh, in the same way that work does, or we are having some periodic domain effects, okay? As well, we, we have been studying uh, what happens for each mast, uh, depending the region of stability, and we, we have compared as well the vias just with the standard worth uh, results. You can see we have a, a good improvement when you compare for the uh, full mesoscale simulations, but I have to say that if you look for the paper of the benchmark of allies that Javier Santis is, is preparing and we are going to present, I think on WESC, uh, you will see that uh, there are all other coupling strategies that are working better at this moment, especially worth yes. So uh, this is still a lot of working to do in order to improve this, this strategy. Okay, what's next? We are validating on Horna Mosen. Uh, this is a very interesting case because Horna Mosen, the terrain is, is more simple, but we have a lot of forest. So we need to understand how to couple WORF and the, the micro scale uh, models when we have forest and then there is canopy and there are radiation effects are important. We have some preliminary results. Here I show some preliminary results for the third day of the benchmark for at, at the night and at the, at the noon uh, with comparison with WORF. At the moment, things look good. This is 1D and now we are beginning to run the 3D. And of course, at the end, we want to move to Mexico and to validate the full methodology using the classification of CMAT our uh, coupling with Wolf alias and Wolf France, and uh, do the, the, the assessment using the Iberdrola data. Okay, so thank you. Okay. And of course, if there are questions. Uh, yes, so well, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, there are many, many questions here. Uh, so I think we have time for at least okay. a couple of them. So I will, I will read them out loud uh, by order of appearance. And the first question was, uh, do you expect some gain in computing time if you did not rely on WORF, but decided to force the micro scale? Sorry, because uh, somebody changed, no? where's the, where is the chat here? Sorry. Uh, would you uh, gain some computing time if uh, you decided not using WORF, but uh, enforce the micro scale with M MPAS, which I think is a global model or some sort of global yeah. model. So. Yeah, we, we plan to try that uh, with uh, uh, with another global model. But yes, this is something that we, we are going to to test on the on this finite month of the of the of the project, and we will see. Yeah, this is an interesting question actually to see if, uh, which is the gain really of using WORF. And maybe because we need very big scales, very large scales, we can usually directly use a, a global model information. Yeah. Okay. A second question is: uh, Could you kill this uh, wake while they are going out of the periodic boundary, increasing the viscosity, for instance, when vorticity is high? Yeah, we thought on that, and we don't like to match this approach uh, because it's you are altering as well the the, the turbulence field. Okay. And we, we prefer to, to look for an approach like this one that we are talking more geometrical. And if the domain is big enough, I think it's, it's going to be good enough. But it, 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 it has been something that we have been considering. Yeah, at the moment, we don't want to follow this route. Uh, can you please, uh, Oriol, stop sharing the screen? Sure. And, OK, now, thank you very much. Uh, so I think we have time for a. Uh, Another question is, uh, thanks for your presentation. Could you give some details on the computational cost of the simulation you showed using approach two? Yeah, for the approach two, we needed uh, four days in order to have the, the four days of the benchmark. Yeah, and we were using 2000 CPUs. The mesh is uh, about 100 million elements. And and the resolutions, uh, I, I was very rushed at that part because I have been talking too much at the beginning. Uh, the resolution, uh, let me tell you that, and this is important. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it's 16 kilometers by 16 kilometers. Tangential resolution is 35 meters and the, the normal is 10 meters. And I think the last question, I think we have time for the last question. Uh, we are on time. Uh, in the case of your LES SES model, what exactly is meant by algebra plus the conventional Smagorinsky? Yeah, we use an algebraic wall law. So using a, a, a wall law that is for wind energy applications, but it's an algebraic wall law. I mean, we are not solving extra equations, uh, PDA equations in order to get the, the short stress at the wall. This is what I mean. Uh, for the LES model, we use an Smagorinsky. Um, we, we try other uh, LES models, but honestly, uh, here the driver was really the mesoscale. At, the, at least at the moment that we are, maybe we still have uh, errors with the domain and we're still learning, no? And Smagor we, we didn't see too much difference, so we were using Smagorinsky because it's the, the cheaper one. Okay, I think there are no more, no more questions here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Oriol, for the presentation. So the next presentation is uh, titled Offline Mesoscale Microscale Coupling for Wind Energy Resources Using a Simple Approach by Andrea Hammond. Andrea is a senior scientist in the Department of Wind Energy at the Technical University of Denmark since 2008. Previously, she was project scientist in the Research Applications Laboratory at the National NCAR and a research scientist professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Arizona. Her scientific focus areas are related to wind energy, resource assessment, climate, mesoscale atmospheric, land surface, and numerical modeling. So, Andrea, your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, we, I don't know, Andre, if you already know. Muted. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I am. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the uh, invitation to participate. Um, 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 uh, I, I see I'm going to deviate a little bit from, from, from the rest of the group um, because um, uh, I want to discuss that um, they are uh, many other ways that we can use microscale modeling uh, uh, results, and, and perhaps uh, those are becoming a lot very important for certain applications. Um, so I would like first to to um, acknowledge the help from a lot of my colleagues from from DGU, and and some of them are are listening to me right now. I hope I don't say anything wrong, and then the colleagues from the NIWA project. I know some of them are there as well, listening to me. Uh, and uh, this will talk a little bit about what what have we done since since Niwa. Um, but uh, I hate this. I don't okay, uh, essentially, uh, I think it's clear to all that are here in the audience that uh, that that we need downscaling for size assessment. Um, if we need to build a wind farm, we need to know what the production will be. That's an obvious. An obvious part of, of uh, downscaling that, that we all know about and we all you know expect. However, there are other groups that are use the data we produce and, and they also need accurate uh, resources. Uh, for example, there is a whole set of people which I have been collaborating in the last year or so that uh, for example, derive technical potentials, they want to know you know, in Germany, if, if we construct such and such capacity, this, we build this much um, uh, wind farms, how much energy can we produce, you know, and in different places in Europe. Um, and it is not clear exactly. And I haven't, I have asked them many times, what is the, what is the, after you consider all the other things that you need to consider. You can't build next to roads. You cannot build here. You cannot build there. After you consider everything, is it really the underlying wind resources that you put that necessary? And I still haven't gotten the answer, but, but it is a very interesting problem, I think. Uh, the other area that is also very important is in the, in the part of, of power system planning. Um, they, you know, these time series need accurate 
descriptions of how is the wind varying in one region in relation to the other ones and, and what are the scenarios that you will end up. So you not only need to know how much you need to build, but how much you need to build constrained by the variability in different regions of, of Europe, for example, and, and even in, in larger contexts. So uh, essentially I'm arguing that yes, we need very, very complicated simulations for some places on earth where things, everything goes wrong and, and you really need a very retail simulation. But at the same time, we also need simpler simulations which give you relatively good results in, in large areas. And this is the case that we've been using, uh, using WASP and, and now PyWASP uh, methods. And, and these are very simple, but that what it means is that then you can, you, you are not constrained to, to uh, 24 hours or 48 hours like Errol was talking about, but we can do a whole simulation for all of Europe in a few hours and change, for example, the warp configuration and make new simulations for a long time. So anyway, I think most of you are aware or understand how this works, um, that you have a some sort of um, uh, uh, wharf model output. In this case, this is the general picture that, that comes from, from the WASP uh, world where you have a measurement a, at a mast somewhere and you want to make a calculation for a wind farm here. And then you, you use the observed wind climate, you generalize it, you remove the surface roughness changes, the terrain, and use the geostrophic drug law to now come up with a generalized wind climate and then you add all these factors back on with the rain elevation and some of roughness and you have a predicted wind climate. We can do the same kind of operation with wharf model output and then with micro scale model output. And we can do them over very large grids uh, to show you an example from uh, South Africa, which is the project we just uh, completed the third part. So for example, this is in the Southern coast of, of uh, South Africa, and you can see this is the mesoscale simulation. That mesoscale simulation is of course, part of it is derived from this height as WARF sees it. So in the mesoscale, this is what the height is, and this is what the roughness is. But in the real world, so if we remove these and then we add back what the microscale roughness is and the microscale heights are, we obtain a new map where all the details of the terrain that you see in the microscale in the real topography become evident. So this process of going from here, removing this and adding this is what I'll talk about mostly here. I should mention that the new methods that we have developed, you can also include stability in it. And the stability in this case comes from the mesoscale model output. Um, so this is again the method. And, and what I'm gonna do now is to, to uh, go through a few examples of where we have used this and, and what the new things that we have learned along the way. And actually we learn a lot, a lot actually I think after, after Niwa um, that some of you might not have seen before, but some of you, I apologize. I know some of you are here very familiar with the Global Wind Atlas and Niwa um, as well. So anyway, this is the uh, uh, Global Wind Atlas, and this is a place where the whole calculation was done for the whole for the whole globe. Uh, and for this, um, the mesoscale calculations were done by by Vortex, and I see Pep in the audience. So the the world was divided in many tiles, um, actually 2,000 and 2,500 mesoscale modeling tiles, each about 300 kilometers by 300 kilometers, and then they were blended together, generalized, and then out of this, then the world was divided again in a series of tiles where the microscale calculations were done for each of these tiles. Um, in this case, uh, the whole resolution is 250 meters globally. And, and, and by the way, there is a new version of the Global Wind Atlas 3.1 that was released a couple of days ago where you can uh, derive a lot more parameters than you did before. But there have been three versions of it. Global Wind Atlas 1 was, was generated using mirror reanalysis directly. 
the global wind atlas two, which was actually you done with nine by nine kilometer resolution wharf, and the latest version that comes from wharf simulation at three by three kilometers and era five forcing. Uh, one of my colleagues have done some verification. This is perhaps something you haven't seen before, which is concentrated in, in the application of it. And of course, it has no complex terrain. Most of these wind farms are offshore, but you can take actually the yield that you get from the observation. So you take a massed observation and compute what will be the production from this wind farm given that uh, uh, data, and you can take what you will get if you use the results from the Global Wind Atlas. And you can see that over time, the results have been getting better. Um, if we take the orange points first, and then the latest one, which is the Global Wind Atlas 3 here on, on the black line. Uh, but again, this is simple terrain. Uh, how does it perform in, in complex terrain? Uh, it's yet to be... Uh, found out because uh, we don't have that many measurements. And that was that is one of the main problems that we don't really understand. And we don't know how many places we're making mistakes. Uh, and that's perhaps one of the main things that we need to focus on. Uh, the second application comes from NIWA and um, it's the New European Wind Atlas. And, and by the way, that was done at uh, Moral Dostrom 4, uh, given a praise allocation. We used a lot of computer time, kept the machine busy for a while. Here, what we focus a lot of the mesoscale results was in trying to find the, the optimal configuration for the wharf uh, model simulations. And, and we run over 50 ensemble members for a whole year. Uh, but again, we had the problem of simple sites where we actually had data. Uh, but out of this work, uh, we finalized what was the base case that we run all 30 years of the mesoscale simulations. Uh, and by the way, there is a couple of papers uh, in, in geophysical model development that uh, talk about this, um, about the sensitivity studies, and then talks about the microscale coupling that was done in that case. Um, in this case, instead of tiles, what we did was that we chose 10 separate domains covering Europe, they all share the outer domain. The outer domain is the same, but each of them was centered in a specific area. Um, and then these were generalized and then they were merged into specific tiles. And then the PyWASP, in this case, the calculation was done with the Python version of, of WASP to, to generate a microscale uh, description at 50 meters in this case for all of Europe. Um, we were very fortunate afterwards that uh, we came up with an agreement with Vestas to use the data from their sites uh, in their site. So we didn't have access to the data itself, but we could make the comparison in their uh, machine and then export the results. And you will see that this is why these things are aggregated. We cannot exactly say where the point is, but we can aggregate the different masts um, and they were over, what was it? Uh, I forget the exact number. You can have an idea here, but uh, uh, some regions are well sampled, other ones perhaps not as well. But you can divide the sites in, in, in terms of their complexity. And in WASP, there is a parameter called the roughness in this. And if you separate these sites, um, you can see what you gain from going, for example, from era five alone to WARF and to WASP, um, what are you gaining in each of the couplings? So ERA5 here means ERA5 alone, WASP, WARF means ERA5 plus WARF, and WASP means ERA5 plus WARF plus WASP. So it's uh, the downscaling all the way down to the site. And you can see that in high complexity, uh, really the ERA5 is the very used, uh, very low. Um, values. So it's not recommended from any place that you have complex terrain, that the values are really uh, very low. Um, but the conclusion here was that uh, overall, if you use the era five, you are, you have a bias of maybe two meters uh, per second in average over all the sites that were used here in the study. If you take um, the uh, wharf alone, actually, these are very good. The bias is almost zero for all the sites. And if you use 
uh, wasp, you actually reduce your spread a little bit, but you increase your bias. And you can understand this because, for example, in some of the uh, cases where the, the terrain is very complex, of course, it was, was not designed for that kind of application. So you, you really increase the error, you overestimate the wind speed over any of these very complex sites. But we were happy to see that at least in the low complexity sites, uh, we were really decreasing the spread. And that's what we were, we were after. We are not claiming that WASP can simulate any of these very complex sites uh, by any means. Uh, but something that perhaps you haven't seen is that when uh, when we use the data from, uh, by the way, um, again, uh, when you use the data from NIWA to, for example, in this uh, power system modeling. So this, let me explain a little bit where how this was done. So there is a measure capacity factor that actually comes from our European transmission operators uh, in Europe. And each of these points is actually the production from one country in Europe for a year. And then in the model, what is done is that you take the time series, for example, from ERA5 and from NIWA and compute used a actually wind turbine height power curve and a simplified wake model to actually come up what will be the capacity factor for that country for that year if you use that data. And you can actually see that once you use, if you use the NIWA alone, you're overestimated, overestimating capacity factors in a lot of places in Europe and even places like Denmark, you have an overestimation. Now, if you take this NIWA and correct it by the global wind atlas, so you apply the micro scale modeling, you actually reduce the bias by quite a bit. Uh, here, we actually don't see the global wind atlas three because actually there is that, uh, that doesn't correct as well as the global winter plus two does. And we have uh, some ideas of why is that happening. Um, but, but again, uh, the lack of, of very complex sites in validation is always a problem. But this is the bottom line. This is a very aggregated view of, of the whole production of, of wind um, over the whole Europe. Um, a recent application comes from the South Africa, and I'm going to take a look at what I'm doing out of time. I'm, I'm doing okay, apparently. Uh, so we have recently made a 30-year simulation for South Africa uh, for uh, using both WARF and, and, and WASP as well. Uh, for this case, we are actually very happy to see that when this is a similar si uh, figure that the one from, from uh, from NIWA that when we use ERA5 again, we have, and in this case, actually they are power densities, they are not the uh, wind speed. So this is exaggerates uh, the problems with the, with the, um, with the downscaling um, that for, yes, uh, ERA5 is really of no use in South Africa. It's, the results are very bad in most places. Uh, these are all our stations in South Africa. There are 19, so I'm very fortunate to have many stations. And there are a, a variety of terrains and climate conditions. And for some of these masts, for example, on the West Coast, we have all 10 years of measurement. So it's really a, an excellent database. Um, when we uh, do the uh, downscaling, uh, ERA plus WARF plus WASP, by WASP here, uh, and we remove the two sites that are more complex, WM9 and WM11. You can see that we are very much narrowing um, the, um, the uh, average uh, of the errors in all the sites. Uh, so what does a very good site looks like? Um, this is, uh, I don't remember exactly which site it is. I think it's WM6. Uh, this is a very good site. So this is the observe. Uh, wind rows. This is what the wharf can do. And this is what Pi was uh, can do. Uh, and here, what we have done is that in previous uh, runs, for example, on the uh, Global Wind Atlas and in, in NIWA, we used an old uh, model called Lincoln to derive the topographical corrections. Um, and now we actually 
have shown and one of my colleagues, Roger Flores, has shown is that we can use PyWASP both to do the generalization and to downscaling. And actually the results are, are quite better than the ones that we got with using the Lincoln method before, which was not exactly matching what, what WARF uh, does. Uh, in addition to that, if we use the stability from the WARF simulations, then we actually come up with something like three and a half percent error in all the sites, uh, which is excellent. And you can see in this here, uh, the errors are 1.2% uh, too high. And this is all in wind speed, not in power density. But sometimes things go wrong. And uh, for example, this is WM3, which is a, a site on the coast. This is a totally different view that you probably haven't seen before, but this is the month of the year. Uh, so this is from January to December here. And this is the hour of the day. So this is zero to zero UTC. And you can see that in the observations, these, the, all these sites on the coast show a very pronounced diurnal, diurnal uh, change in wind in the summer. This is summertime, remember this is the Southern hemisphere. Uh, and then very little in the winter months. Wharf has a very good prediction of that. Sometimes you have one or two hours off, but, but in, in, in most of them uh, are very good. But then we have a very strange site, which is w, WM19 here, which the observation hosts show no diurnal cycle and no annual cycle and Wharf insists on showing that. And at the end, uh, you know, we want to move forward from these downscaling to use not only the climatology, but being able to predict these, you know, these, these variations in a year and, and the time of the day are important for power system studies. So, so we need to get them right as well. And here, actually, when you compare the, the, the uh, power prediction here, it's not too bad because we are compensating wharf has less wind uh, at night than the observation. So you end up with a prediction that it's not too bad. But, but once you look at the details, things are something is really going wrong. And, and, and we really don't know what is it's being predicted so wrong. Uh, other sites are not not too bad, but this one is totally an, an anomaly. Um, so if uh, if you want to try to predict the case here, and it's totally flat, there is no topography. Something else, perhaps stability is going on here that, that really makes a very very bad prediction. Andrea, you have a couple of minutes more. Yeah, yes, I'm coming to the exciting part for the Mexican partners. Uh, our lightest uh, wind class is for, for Mexico. In this case, we have actually seven stations and there is a couple three more that uh, are measuring but for a smaller period um, and here um, actually we encounter a totally different set of challenges uh, so we did just like we did in 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 NIOA and we did in the in the WASA period we did an ensemble of simulations to try to figure out what was the best uh, configuration for the wharf simulations and then to our surprise we come up that the errors in some of the sites were well above what we found in new and when we find in south africa for for example this mass 7 which is also in puebla here uh, some of the simulations have actually 60 percent error in, in wind speed uh, i mean they are really really off of touch uh, the terrain is quite complex the site is in a very weird you know strange place we had a lot of trouble locating the sites in Mexico because of many other problems. Uh, but not only this case has a problem, but the case also in, in here in Oaxaca, which is one of the windiest places on earth. Um, it's wind speed is maybe 13 meters per second on average. So it's very, very windy. There's a lot of wind farm here. There also we had you know, very large overestimations. And of course the microscale model can do nothing here. Um, but uh, then we run, I try to see what was going on here uh, and working with the mesoscale simulations, trying to see, is there something I can do that improve on this? And, and I don't expect you to read everything, but you know, I change, try to change one thing at a time, trying to figure out, you know, what is wrong here? What can we do better? And, and at the end, you'll see that there is one of the cases has shown uh, lower errors and that's probably what we already have run the simulations by the way Dalibor has already run 
the cases here. But let me show you a little bit of the details of what made a difference here. And here, what I'm trying to say perhaps is that, uh, yes, the coupling is very nice, but sometimes Worf gets it very wrong. And, and in those cases, if you're doing the coupling and Worf is wrong, there is no chance for your microscale model to solve anything. So, so you need to get that part correct. Here, what made the difference was both the diffusion term. In, in NIWA, we run everything with this diffusion option equal one, which is more stable and actually makes a lot of the diffusion terms act on, on a slope when you have terrain. But the correct way to do this is actually to do it horizontally. That's how it happens in nature. So, uh, so you should actually use this diffusion option too. The second thing that we change here, that I changed, was to change the, the height of the first model level. Uh, and, and doing both these changes actually have improved the simulations to from the 25% that we had before to about 16 and from 40 to 18%. But let me show you what these things matter and what, what they matter about. This is, all, this is the same. Everything is the same. The only thing that has been changed here is the diffusion option in this case and the height of the first model level. And you can see that actually you get changes to maybe two meters per second, three meters per second, just by doing that. And if we focus on the sites that we're interested, uh, in this case for uh, the sites mass seven, you can see the very complex topography. And what made a difference here was changing this, the height of the first model level. Uh, in the case in, in Oaxaca and uh, mass four, you also get a decrease for both this diffusion option and by the change in the height. Uh, but here are actually some of the things that I changed were the sea surface temperatures and the roughness around the terrain. So in conclusion here, um, I think there's still place for simple models. And maybe I convince you that there's a lot of people out there that, that want to use our results for other things that are important as well. Um, and, and that there is a need to know where and when are these models useful? When do we really need for to, to do a, a total coupling? Um, and uh, perhaps some of the machine learning techniques could be useful for this kind of applications. Can we find out? Uh, do we know where in the global wind atlas things are okay and where they are not? Uh, those things are uh, you know, um, important. And uh, to fur further with my last slides is that uh, the art of setting up wharf is still uh, hard to do. And, and for each case, you will learn something new. Um, and uh, that's what I had for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andreas. Really, really interesting. Um, uh, we have one question here. Uh, let me is, uh, why would somebody use uh, TIFF option one? Or when does it depend on surface layer scheme choice? Um, yes and no. Well, the, the, the answer to that is that in version uh, 3.8 or earlier, you actually had a much more stable model when you run it with option one. Um, and when you're running, for example, in this case, in Wasa for 30 years, you want to avoid having to go and restart your model every time that you have that the model blows up. Uh, so that's a reason for, for using it, um, uh, for using the option one. But again, it's something that, you know, you set it up at one point and you forgot you had it there. And all of a sudden, when things go wrong, you go back and you start revising your name list and you find, hmm, maybe that was really not necessary. What happens if I change this? And, and, and the implications are quite large. Um, Thank you. Yes, and uh, actually, the, this was the best case scenario in the, in the case in, in Mexico. Uh, the other ones with other boundary layer and surface layer schemes actually were even larger errors than this. Uh, first of all, I forgot to mention that uh, Pep Moreno is uh, saluting you and thanking you for the acknowledgement on the work. So Pep is You're with welcome. us today. And uh, just uh, one last question. I think we have a minute for that. Um, thank you for the talk, Andrea. Uh, can you comment on the performance of ERA-5 alone in comparison with the 
to the others in the production comparison plot over Europe? Yeah, um, I I can comment in it's it's we have known from previous versions of Era Five that that if you have to rain, the the uh, the temporal uh, performance is it's okay. Uh, if you look at the correlations, we are in many places better off than using mesoscale models. When you use mesoscale models, actually some of these correlations go down and you see it in NIWA. Uh, however, if you're looking for the absolute values, you can see it in, in, in our plots that sometimes you underestimate the, the wind speed by you know, up to four meters per second. In Mexico is also really bad and in South Africa is actually very bad. But in terms of timing, if you're interested in, in power system and you're interested in, in the you know, uh, diurnal and annual cycle, they are actually very good. But that's why uh, uh, some of our colleagues have started merging both, right? So you get the advantage from the micro scale model from correcting your time series, and then you, could, you get the good timing from the era five uh, simulations. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think there are some other questions, but I think we should uh we should go on uh, if not we will we'll be running late so uh, uh thank you andrea so much for the presentation it was really really interesting and um the last presentation is titled meso to micro dynamic offline coupling the tendencies approach by dalibor kabar dalibor is a senior scientist in the department of wind energy at the technical university of denmark since 2013 uh, his research areas are related to computational fluid dynamics, so including turbulence modeling, including RANS and LES, CFD related to industrial flows and physical processes in internal combustion engines, microscale computations of atmospheric boundary layer flows with uh, focus on canopy and atmospheric stability effects, coupling of mesoscale and microscale models, and he also works extensively with uh, high performance computing, HPC, both as a system administrator and uh, consultant. So, uh, Dalibor, welcome. And uh, thank you. There you go. So, can you see my screen? In uh... yes. Okay. So maybe this is better. So as you can see, I'm also coming from uh, DTU, from the same section and department that uh, Andrea is uh, coming from uh, as well. And uh, I will talk uh, about this micro to, uh, meso to micro coupling that uh, we've been working on and I've been working on in particular for some time now. So we started looking in our uh, Ellipsis 3D uh, microcode, uh, the implementations of and the effects of stability on the velocity profile some time ago with the work of Tillman Koblitz in 2015. And he focused on the Gables 2 case, which is an idealized case uh, looking on constant uh, geostrophical wind uh, and uh, diurnal cycle effects are brought about uh, using the temperature, the, the surface temperature variations. And he actually showed that ellipses can uh, reproduce those effects uh, on, on, on stability effects on, on the velocity. So the next, in a sense, natural step here was to follow up on what uh, Sans Rodrigo and uh, who is also here uh, did. So this is pretty much the same slide that Oreo has uh, previously shown. But the idea here is to, instead of using idealized uh, geostrophic wind, uh, the PG terms here, uh, I don't know, can you see my mouse? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, so the PG terms, which is the, the pressure gradient uh, uh, term uh, and enrich that with the advection terms and try to feed that back uh, into the micro model. On the same way, we are putting the advection part from the temperature equation and passing it on, and we are using uh, this equation to estimate the temperature at the surface uh, boundary, which is uh, fed back to the micro model. So it seemed like uh, this Gables 3 benchmark uh, case, uh, which has been set up uh, in first in 2014, I guess, and then revisited during the NEVA project seem to be a good candidate on uh, trying to validate uh, how this actually works. So this case is 
I would call it uh, pretty close to an ideal case uh, that, that we can get, but still occurring uh, in, in, in reality. Uh, a lot has been done to kind of choose this, uh, this date to do the analysis on, uh, but even though it's close to an ideal, uh, it, it still has a complexity of low level jet appearing here. So there was a benchmark uh, which has been set up here, uh, I think also by Javier uh, some uh, a while ago, where from our side we've been able to participate both using a Urans approach, using the 1D, uh, uh, model, uh, then using the exactly same approach and you using the 3D uh, model and actually also using the LES. Uh, if we now look on the results of 1D and 3D model uh, regarding the velocities and the temperature, we can actually see quite, uh, quite good resemblance in between as we also expected it to be. So before moving on to more complex terrain, uh, I actually thought it was interesting to see why the things are going some reasonably, reasonably well uh, in this particular site. So here we are looking at 0.0, .0 should be like the mass position where the Cabao site is, and the rest is terrain surrounding it. So clearly we can't say that there is a lot of orographical complexity included uh, in this site. So in principle, uh, any WARF model which can give uh, reasonable results here or any uh, any modeling level uh, we are using from WARF, uh, WARF should, uh, should be good enough. We don't have any double accounting of terrain effects uh, to be worried about. So I started looking into this uh, and start using the 27 kilometer grid uh, as a start point. Uh, we are looking at the three days where the middle day is the day of uh, where the Gables uh, three case was considered. So we have a day before and day after that day. We are looking at a 60 minutes adjustment uh, or the feed stream, uh, which comes from uh, the main, uh, from the Wolf model down to the 1D model. And in the top row, we are seeing at the uh, Wolf results. And in the bottom row, we are seeing the corresponding results from the 1D model. So we can see that uh, doing this, uh, we, we got some resemblance in, in the 1D model, but we can also see uh, based on the contour plots, we can see here that the uh, 1D model seems to struggle uh, quite, quite a bit uh, numerically in this particular case. So doing the same uh, with the nine kilometer grid, we can see that the uh, wharf results uh, have slightly changed as well, but we can see again that uh, we are getting even better resemblance uh, between the two. Going down to three kilometers, uh, we still see a reasonable resemblance uh, between the results. And but going all the way to one kilometer, the whole concepts uh, seem to start uh, really breaking up, uh, and we can see uh, exaggerated uh, velocities, especially on day three and also day two. is is really difficult to see the resemblance between the two anymore. So if, if we now change from uh, feeding the information on a 60 minute level, uh, on our basis down to 10 minutes, uh, we can improve uh, some, of, some of the resemblance between the two, uh, between uh, 1D model and, and, and WARF itself. But in a way, it's also interesting to see what exactly are we feeding back uh, inside uh, from WARF uh, down to the 1D model here. So here we're looking at four hour period during this uh, three day period. We are looking at 10 minute snapshots. So in principle, we are looking at uh, 24 different uh, snapshots taken here. Uh, here we are talking about DO4 level from WARF, which is a uh, one kilometer. And we can see this huge uh, spread uh, in the velocity, which is based on the, both pressure gradient, geostrophic wind and the advective tendencies, which ranges from minus 30 to 30 meters per second in the, especially in the lowest 500 meters, which is quite difficult to explain uh, physically, why is this happening? If we do the same uh, and extract data from uh, three kilometer, we can see still that we have uh, a lot of things happening in the bottom part, but we also see that uh, the deviations uh, and the spread is, uh, is much lower in this case. If we go down to nine kilometer domain of wharf, we still see the the numerical instability is appearing and even at 27 kilometers we can see uh, that a lot is happening uh, in, in the bottom uh, one kilometer uh, regarding the wolf so no wonder 1d model especially driven by like uh, one hour uh, 
one hour feed uh, has a lot of trouble in, in catching up here. So my colleague Bjarke Olsen has pointed me towards uh, this work of Ting Shen Shen uh, from 2020, who actually tried to address some of those issues. So they published both a paper and the code, which does this inline averaging. And inline averaging means that instead of looking on a snapshot every 10 minutes, we are basically averaging uh, the tendencies for 10 minutes and then writing them out. And we can see a significant improvement uh, on doing this, on, on trying to settle down on what's going on in the below uh, one kilometer. But if we move uh, to, to one kilometer domain, the previous slide was a three kilometer domain, we can see that we, that we are uh, dampening uh, the, the variations quite a bit, but we still have, but we can't get completely rid, rid of that. Uh, so we still have some issues uh, to, to consider here. So on this slide, uh, I'm showing the results uh, using the filtered mesoscale data. So using this approach of Shen uh, and then applying the 10 minute adjustment uh, and applying that uh, to, the, to the results of, uh, of the, to, to the 1D model, we can see a significant improvement uh, compared to the previous slide. I think uh, one should also note that once we are talking about 10 minute uh, data that WOLF itself starts showing a lot of uh, wiggling effect here. So the contours are not smooth anymore. So, I mean, WOLF is based on a four to six order uh, numerics, uh, which does come into the play here. So, but using, uh, on the other hand, uh, this filtered data and still applying it at, at a 60 minutes basis uh, is still giving us the trouble. So uh, apparently there is a trade-off here, uh, which needs to be considered. So the idea from the beginning was basically to mostly focus on a 3D. So if we do exactly the same uh, thing now in 3D, uh, that would uh, correspond to using a periodical domain here taken as 27 by 27 kilometers and then apply exactly the same profile of the geostrophic wind advection tendencies and the temperature tendencies and apply one single temperature uh, for, for this whole domain. So, but since we are in 3D, uh, I mean, if, if we now look uh, on, on the WOF domain uh, taken from uh, three kilometers, I mean, WOF would resolve this uh, by nine by nine cells. So I start thinking about, well, well what if instead uh, we try to apply all those cells uh, instead of applying just the, the one from, from the middle point? I mean, what would happen now? I'm not depicting each of those, I'm just putting some lines here indicating that we are applying now many profiles. In this case, uh, we are talking about 81 and maybe we can also go all in here and apply 729 uh, of those profiles uh, in the one kilometer, from the one kilometer walk domain. Uh, one should also note the temperature follows uh, with this. So we are basically also uh, passing on the 729 different uh, temperatures of the surface uh, together uh, with this information. So I actually did this and uh, got the results based on 60 minutes adjustments uh, using this 81 uh, profiles here and actually got uh, quite good, quite reasonable resemblance, I would say. Still, we have some numerical issues that, uh, that we need to take into account in a sense, but comparing this to what's happening if we use those filtered mesoscale tendencies, uh, the picture actually does not uh, significantly change. What actually ended up surprising me was that if I use this method and applying uh, unfiltered mesoscale tendencies at 60 minute adjustment, the, the case that previously in 1D went very bad, uh, now we are starting to see a completely different picture. I mean, we still see the, the, the wiggling approach uh, and, and the wiggling problems, but we can clearly see a much better resemblance between the results. So it seems that there is kind of a trade-off here that if we apply many, uh, many profiles given from both, uh, some of these uh, numerically introduced artifacts uh, start canceling each other and start in a sense helping us out. And uh, I also did uh, comparison to the, you know, filtered mesoscale velocities uh, or tendencies uh, applied, but again, the picture is kind of uh, the same, not, not much uh, change here. 
So it seems that this, what could be called like applying the 3D tendencies, uh, had some ideas to be applied on a, on a different size with a certain complexity. And, and one of them is the Pradigao site, uh, which has been thoroughly investigating during the NIVA project. And in the NIVA project, uh, uh, the focus was on the two ridges located at 0.0, .0 position here. And now we are talking about 90 meter SRTM uh, data here. So already here we have a trouble in seeing uh, the two ridges and the valley in between. So no wonder any uh, mesoscale model really have trouble in, in getting uh, reasonable gap flow results uh, here. But for me, it was also interesting to see this uh, from the perspective of wharf like uh, if, we, if we now put or superimpose the nine kilometer wharf grid here, uh, we can't really claim that we are seeing much of the surrounding terrain. I mean, especially here, we would, we would end up in some average uh, uh, value uh, that, that is applied, but can't really see uh, the effect of this uh, on, on the general flow. Of course, if we go down on three kilometers, this, those things start uh, becoming more and more resolved and uh, going all the way down to one kilometer, as many of those things are still uh, uh, getting better and better resolved, but still we would, we would have problems in, in seeing exactly what's happening at, at the location of interest. And first, if we go down uh, to well below 100 meter uh, resolution here taken as a 40 meter micro scale resolution used, uh, we can clearly see the two ridges and the valley in between which, uh, which was uh, in, in focus for those experimental uh, investigations. So now uh, maybe the domain here looks a bit strange, but this is an artifact of what Oriol was also talking about, uh, the periodicity of the boundary conditions where we are smoothing everything towards uh, one single uh, height uh, on, on all lateral uh, sides. Uh, so uh, this site has been uh, both numerically investigated, among others, by Bjarke, uh, Olson during his PhD and many others. Uh, and there are uh, many mass locations that could be interested to, to analyze here, but I actually chose the results from the mast 20, which is on the top of the first ridge, mast 29, on top of the second ridge and mast 25, which is uh, in between the ridges uh, deep down uh, into the valley as a representative uh, for the flow analysis that I will show uh, in a while. So, so doing uh, the approach uh, that we that I introduced previously, uh, now we are talking about uh, the wolf results based on uh, on the tendency approach from Shen. Uh, we are looking from DO2 corresponds to nine kilometer, DO3 uh, three kilometer, and DO4 corresponds to one kilometer uh, live feed. Uh, we are ending up at those. Uh, at the mast positions uh, with the figures like this. And one of the first things I notice here is that, I mean, actually Wharf is doing quite okay at one kilometer uh, on the mast 20 and 29, which are on the top of the two ridges, but in a sense fails uh, pretty much uh, because it can't really see what's happening in, in the valley. And that's something uh, our model uh, is in a sense uh, it's what its uh, micro scale model supposed to uh, to fix uh, and, and do in this particular case. So we can also see some some areas like uh, this particular event, uh, which seems to be uh, seen by Wolf and not seen by the measurements, but is kind of uh, reproduced by uh, by the micro models following Wolf. Uh, it also happens on both uh, on both ridges, it seems. And we can also see that the O4 model has its own way of interpreting what's going on in the beginning of this period. And we are talking about uh, nine day periods uh, in uh, 2017 in late March. But we can also see that none of the models, neither WARF nor the microscale models are, are capable of reproducing what's happening in the evening here between the 19th and 20th of, of, of April. So another way of looking at all of this is also looking uh, what's happening if we do average all those nine days uh, into some single plots, because the previous one may be good to give us some quantitative thing, but here we can also see if we do the averages or how well we are doing. 
we have some strange looking profiles here and that's due to the uh, the availability of the measurements were especially these heights on mass 20 uh, was the problematic one, but I also put the wolf profile uh, in its full extent, uh, in the, which is the solid line on the plots and the other lines uh, are called correlated, correct, corrected uh, to, to reflect the, the measurements uh, availability. What we can clearly see here is that uh, we are doing, it seems that we are doing quite okay uh, doing this microscale process, but we can also see it at all locations that uh, DO3 and DO4 results, I mean, three and one kilometer based results are outperforming the, like the nine kilometer based uh, downscaling results. And we can also see that there are some issues uh, in the bottom part here very close to the ground, which need, we, we need to understand a bit uh, in more details, uh, I think, in the following part. What I also realized uh, during this was that uh, I did something similar, but actually quite a while ago, uh, maybe two or even three years ago. Uh, and I remember it uh, weekly that uh, I actually didn't uh, account uh, issues with being able to resolve this particular event. So I went and try to search for one of those runs I did uh, quite a while ago and then got quite surprised that uh, I could using 80 meter resolution versus the 40 meter resolution that has been used in the previous slides using the upwind differencing scheme uh, versus the uh, quick scheme I mean uh, could obtain something like this so we are kind of going down in both uh, resolution and putting much more dissipative scheme into the play, but still can get the results like this. Uh, so I've been in all of this exclusively working with a 381 version of WARF uh, with uh, some NIVA co corrections. And as I understood on Andrea that those corrections are extremely small and shouldn't, uh, shouldn't reproduce something like this. Uh, but the results, but the results presented here are also used with the plain version of, of Wolf, enriched by this uh, this uh, possibility for inline sampling of the of the tendencies. So to be completely sure that uh, we are on the same uh, page here, I actually found uh, the Wolf run that I was used uh, to produce. Uh, this previous case, and then I got quite surprised that uh, this wolf run suddenly seized the effect or seized the event like this. And uh, well, I had some talk uh, with Andrea about this, and uh, I got persuaded to, to actually do exactly the same in the two uh, versions to be sure that we are doing the same. Uh, so uh, here we are looking on a red line and the blue line, which represent exactly the same version of WARF, but just compile in two different ways. So uh, the way that the optimal, com co the, what I would call the optimal speed, optimal for speed uh, uh, compilation uh, is, is done both on this Shen version and on the Neva version and they in a, in a sense, uh, quite agree to, to each other, but we can also see that uh, this version or the same version of WARF as, as the blue line here compiled in a very close uh, to what I would call a debug mode actually could reveal events like this. So my idea here is not to start a big discussion of how this can be, but maybe reiterate what Andrea was, has, has already uh, told us that, I mean, if, if we uh, have events which are not related uh, to the to the grid size which are not related to to the terrain that we are looking at uh, that that we might be uh, in a lot of trouble uh, being able to reproduce that or we basically don't have any uh, means and tools to 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 correct that uh, on the micro scale level uh, Dalibor, you have a few minutes left, please. Okay, so, so well, uh, now I would just want to say that, uh, well, on this slide, that it's actually, if, if you look again on what's what's happening here, we can't really say that uh, one of one of both compilation is much better than the other one. Uh, but we can also see that uh, if we do the average of the results, we can see that we are actually much better off using the, the final resolution and uh, using uh, 
and, and using a better uh, numerical scheme uh, to, to obtain them. So, well, now moving to the LIEs where we are kind of going significantly up in the complexity of the terrain here. Uh, again, using like the view of nine kilometers, we can't really claim that we see uh, a lot of the terrain going down to three or one kilometer. We can increase uh, the, the wolf's ability to reproduce the results here. And as, as, as we will see uh, pretty fast uh, in, in the following. And this is the micro scale domain which has been used and which has been targeted towards, uh, towards this benchmark case, uh, which was focused on, the, on mostly on the northerly and uh, northwesterly uh, winds. Uh, again, LX17 case uh, was considered here and I will quickly show the results from the M6, M7 and MP5. Uh, sites which seem to be representative of the of the you know of the whole experiment here. So M M6 site seems to be uh, the one of interest because it's on the lee side of Taranara Ridge, which uh, most of the wolf uh, models or in general uh, the meso models would have trouble in seeing. So here we are looking on the results uh, based on the micro model uh, fed at 27 kilometer uh, level. Uh, so we can see immediately that here uh, we can improve the results compared to the wharf because uh, we are seeing uh, the terrain in more correct way, but we can also see that we are failing at a position of mass M7 in, in the middle of the valley and uh, we also got, uh, in a sense, reasonable results on, on top of, uh, of Valais. Uh, now imposing the nine kilometer grades on this, we can see that we are significantly improving the results and in the middle of the of the valley. Uh, we are also improving results in this area here, but we also introduce uh, some some extra uh, velocity, which uh, which is not uh, in reality seen in the measurement here. And then putting like the third, uh, like uh, three kilometer and one kilometer data. Well, the picture becomes uh, pretty blurred here. So we can't really see uh, the differences anymore, but uh, at the end, I will show uh, the comparison using some uh, averaged uh, ways of, of doing this. Uh, so, it, so for me, it was interesting to take one of those cases and actually compare uh, how, do we, how do we do compared to the LES uh, done at this part. So I team up uh, with Roberto, who was kind enough to provide me the results of the 111 meter uh, LES and I, was able to run his setup at the 40 meters. But uh, both of those uh, LES versions or Wolf LES versions, uh, they still have, uh, like they're still based on 90 meter uh, SRTM data. So we are not completely able to see the terrain. And Roberto also pointed me towards uh, some issues in using the TS lists to extract the data uh, from WARF, which can mean that we can be a couple of even a couple hundred meters off uh, when we are taking uh, the results out. So, so all of this uh, basically means that uh, I wouldn't, I would call the LES results very preliminary, but nevertheless, uh, it, it is kind of interesting to see how we are doing here compared to the, to the LES itself. Uh, so again, we are looking on the on the three uh, mass positions here, and we can clearly see that uh, that here uh, LES at 40 meters is starting to see uh, the terrain, but can't really do it uh, all the way due to this resolution issue. But if we especially look on the on the two cases where we have mast three and mast six uh, together, which are both on the, on the back of the Tahunara Ridge in, on the lee side, uh, we can see that at M3, uh, both the 111 and 40 meter LES are doing a better job. Uh, so the last part I would present here uh, regards our uh, upcoming paper, uh, which is uh, dealing with uh, explaining what's uh, going on uh, and uh, is doing the benchmark uh, with, with several uh, different uh, participants. So I've been using uh, those stability cases just to show uh, how uh, the intercomparison uh, in between those uh, is working. So here we can see that uh, we have like a DO2 model, like the nine kilometer 
uh, based uh, runs uh, deviate uh, significantly in some of those cases and sticking out compared to the others. You're looking on a stable case for this particular uh, run. And then uh, we are looking for a neutral case uh, where we now have uh, DO1 and partially also DO4 based results, uh, 27 and one kilometer based results, which have some deviations compared to the rest. And especially if we look at this unstable case, we can see the DO1 uh, case is really sticking out and is not uh, able to reproduce a lot. Uh, so, so all in all, looking on, on, on those figures, uh, it, it seems that uh, DO3 based results uh, kind of giving the best compromise. And for that reason, I also chose to, to go on uh, with using this uh, DO3 results and comparing them to, to the LES. Uh, we can see that uh, at M6, uh, which is no surprise, uh, we are doing uh, quite good. We are also seeing that M1, uh, M1 position, uh, we have this discrepancy between uh, 111 and 40 uh, uh, meter LES, which can have something to do with the uh, with the offset of the position where we where I took uh, the, the the values uh, from the solver uh, at some point and uh, during and looking on the neutral case uh, we now have a in a sense a similar picture we have a kind of pretty big deviation from from our model uh, modeling approach compared to to the LESs but in the rest uh, it seems to work okay and then in the but unstable case. Sorry. Well, this is this is my last slide. So okay, in, thank in, you. In the in the in the unstable case, uh, this would be again the picture. So, the conclusion, in a sense, here is that uh, well, all this approach uh, can uh, can also give us uh, some indications of of what we are doing, and uh, it doesn't really fall down compared to the LES, which is uh, much more advanced and much more complex and much more expensive uh, way of, of doing this. So maybe I can just leave this summary up uh, and, and you can continue uh, with, with the program if I have exceeded the time because I didn't really see how I was doing on the time here. Yeah, we, we run in a couple of minutes late, but uh, if you want to add some comment, I think we, we are on time if you have one. OK, have so so I mean, basically, the, the three sites here uh, were compared and, and analyzed. And they are covering from completely flat terrain to complex terrain of Perdigao and very complex terrain of Alaïs. We, we seem to obtain a reasonable uh, agreement, especially with the measurements, especially in places where we are supposed uh, to improve those results. And that's on the lee side of Donara Ridge or in, in, in the gap in between uh, uh, the Pedigal ridges. It seems that applying this 3D versus 1D tendencies uh, seem to improve uh, results in general. And also it seems that there is kind of a trade-off be between uh, what results seem to give the, the best approach here. Because if, I mean, if we go all the way down to DO4, then we probably introduce uh, a lot of effects from WOLF, which we are double counting for. But if we are using like nine kilometer and especially 27 kilometer uh, feed uh, from WOLF, then we are, have too simple description of the surrounding terrain. So I also pointed out that we have, that there are some issues uh, with those tendencies and they are especially difficult uh, to tackle inside our solver uh, because of the way it has been built up. Uh, so it has a huge impact on the computational speed and possibly also the accuracy. So we still would need to, streamline all this process significantly if we are kind of upscale this uh, to, to kind of production run environment. So that's what's more or less it, I guess. Okay, uh, thank you very much Dalibo for the, yeah. for the presentation. <clears throat> um, sorry, um, I think we're running a bit late. Uh, if you don't mind Dalibo, we probably should go on with the, with the program. Yes, that go would be the, fine with me. To the panel discussion. So there will there might be some questions for you, I guess, or you can uh, yes. you know, say more things about the, this methodology. Anyway, really thanks for the for the presentation. If you can stop sharing the, the screen, please. Yeah. So, can... so how do I do that? 
probably in the same button, share your screen, probably the same one that you were using and clicking it. And stop share, okay. Yeah, yes. that's it. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, as I was, as I was commenting, uh, we were just five minutes late, so I think it's better if we uh, continue with the panel discussion. And um, now we have one hour to discuss different aspects of meso micro coupling between the three presenters and other two panelists that uh, will join us in this section. And first, let me introduce you, uh, Filte Trivino. She's, she's got uh, 20 years experience in wind energy. She's a physicist and, uh, well, I have to say that uh, we studied in the same university. And uh, she's specialized in meteorology and fluid mechanics. She started working in Garat Hassan in 2004, and she's currently head of the energy and Olympics section in DMV Iberia and Latin America. So welcome, uh, Filfe. And also we have uh, Javier Sang that has recently joined the Digital Ventures Lab of Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy as Senior Data Scientist. He has uh, 20 years of experience on R&D devoted to wind resource assessment and forecasting. Since 2011, she is the operating agent of the IEA Wind Task 31st uh, Wake Bench, dealing with the setting up of an international framework for the evaluation of wind power uh, flow models. So uh, the idea in this panel discussion, uh, I think that to help initiate the conversation, uh, well, I have prepared some questions and ideas that I'd like you to, to discuss. So uh, depending on the time that we have for the discussion, we'll go on with the questions or uh, we just stop in things that are probably uh, have some more important importance. So uh, I suggest that uh, for uh, each question, if you please, uh, limit your time to three, four minutes for a statement. And then if we consider that the question needs more attention so we can discuss it further. And uh, well, I think the, um, my first idea on this is that, uh, well, we, we're, we're dealing with uh, model coupling, you know? And we have seen like some examples of model coupling before like global meso with WORF or some other examples of a statistical meso micro coupling. You know, there are many, many techniques. We have seen here today uh, at least two or three different alternative techniques. You know? um, but the things that they are all trying to link dynamics of uh, range of scales from global to micro. You know? And uh, the dynamic one is uh, remains a scientific challenge you know, that has been tackled now, at least in this project in the CICO. But um, my question is, what, what, what do you think could be the benefits of, of usage uh, uh, in such an approach? No, is it uh, something exclusively is of a run a table discussion? Or, uh, excuse me? Or is it exclusively a scientific problem or can, be, or, or can it also bring benefits on, on some other areas? So maybe we can begin with Thirthe uh, that haven't, hasn't spoken yet and she can... Hi, Daniel and everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation. So, uh, I mean, in, in my role in in the last in the in, in the last years in DMV has been to to bring like those scientific solutions to 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 customers that uh, in the end of the of the day are are those that are uh, building up the wind farms and 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 supporting the energy transition, right? So, uh, how what are those uh, scientific um, advantages that we are seeing that can support these customers? What what we are seeing, like in the, in the last years, we were we were really looking at, at flow model to improve how the the wind speed recorded at one mast could be, or at several masts could be extrapolated to other sites in a wind farm to accurately provide an annual energy uh, estimation for. I don't know, financial purposes or, or whatever. More recently, uh, the industry is more and more interested in knowing more about profiles and about a temporal um, a distribution of, of energy. Uh, also about how in uh, the, the the content of the of the of the of the of the, of the wind and the turbulence. Uh, will affect the, the production of uh, wind turbines. And all these points are becoming really, really relevant. So at the same point, I think the what we are seeing is, is, is a bit polarized. We are seeing a lot of uh, 
um, industry demands, which goes uh, to find a lot of detail. And on the other hand, we are still seeing, as Andrea said, a, a lot of uh, uh, stakeholders that are in interested on the high level view, right? Like uh, only, yeah, some, some uh, approximations and, and that's enough. It's not only enough, it's what they are looking for. But yeah, as I said, the, the industry is, is, is demanding much more detail in temporal resolution uh, and therefore also uh, solving more physics of what's going on. Thank you, Hilton. Maybe Javier can add something. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It was very interesting in my workshop. So I've been involved in uh, also microcoupling for, for a while, uh, and previously in just micro. And uh, it's a clear need for, for this type of approaches. Uh, as Steve was saying, uh, we are moving more and more towards uh, using a time series in wind resource assessment and uh, in, in all kinds of applications for, for winds. We need more, um, we need to resolve uh, better the physics of the atmospheric processes that uh, deal with our wind farms. And um, as the wind farms are getting larger and larger, massive scale effects become more, more prevalent. So I think we are moving in that direction. The challenge is how to make these uh, very complex uh, uh, couplings uh, operational for, for, uh, for, uh, for industry because uh, these models are not uh, plug and play, right? So, so we need to uh, fine tune them, validate them fully, and then find a way to make them very robust for, for traditional use. But for sure, the, the roadmap is there for us to, to follow. Meso micro is really the future. Thank you, Javier. Uh, Andrea? Yeah, I will perhaps f follow up a little bit on, on Javier's ideas, which is that uh, uh, it seems like, uh, yeah, and I totally agree that we, we are both polarized that we're looking at these very detailed simulations with the, all the time scales, diurnal and, and so on. And at the same time, you know, the, the aggregated is very important um, and, and in the middle, uh, yeah, both, both those, uh, exist but but i think what happens is that every time we go to a new experiment we learn we learn something new uh, and it's uh, uh you know as has happened from from going from from Niwa to south africa to mexico that you get uh, more and more complicated um sites and 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 you learn something new that you didn't know before uh so it's a little scary because uh, you know why are we missing out there what are the sites that, that we know nothing about uh, right uh, and so the, the the call for for uh, improve observations is so so critical because we only we can only say our models are doing the right thing once we have when we have data to to, to validate them um and and they can be in all kinds of complexity uh the case in mexico it's it's quite uh you know, increasing resolution actually makes things much worse. Uh, so, uh, so it it would depend on your site, and, and we need to understand them all. Um, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Dalibor. Well, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer the question what industry basically needs. As I've been working in academia almost exclusively uh, throughout uh, the time I've been working with this, so. So, I mean, for me, it was interesting to look uh, on those ideas of coupling the meso and micro and trying to, to get this feed of information in, in order to improve uh, the basic understanding of, of, of the flow. So how relevant that is for the industry, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to, to answer at all. If there is a relevance and, and we've been, I've been also uh, recently introduced to working on the models that Andrea is, is working on where we are doing the coupling in a different way. Uh, so not this dynamical, but more like in, in a statistical way, which has been the, the way the industry uh, has been looking at this uh, for a long time. So, I mean, 
there is an obvious, as Oriol was pointing out, there is an obvious expense uh, from the computational point of view. Uh, once we are starting looking in time series, uh, turbulence and, 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 and so on. And uh, whether we can move that to like the GPU architectures uh, and try to improve uh, the speed or the, the time needed to, to do the computations, that's still an open question. I think there is this uh, new LES version uh, from, uh, I guess, NREL, uh, which is trying to address some of those issues. So I think that's, uh, for me to see, that's, that's one of the interesting things uh, coming up. So, yeah. Daniel, uh, one thing I would like to add is uh, one thing is the yeah the uh, the computational cost of this and how that goes to the industry is not is not an obvious thing, and the second one is we we should be very careful to not give a false idea that we can be more accurate and we can be provide that resolution that the industry is needing. Uh, that we can provide that accurately we don't know yet and and that's also one of the of the of the points that before going to the industry is not the, just saying yeah we we are able to provide this and and yeah basically here it is we go and use it uh, yeah we definitely need as andrea said many more observations validations and and testing but I guess that's that's the line we, we need to follow right now. Oh, I, I agree with that. Uh, maybe Oriol has something to add to this uh, conversation. And then I think another topic of, of discussion yeah. would be uh, the access to, to computational resources and so on, as you were saying. Because, uh, so yeah, everything is, is kind of couplet, no, right? So it's it's true that we, we believe that including capping this type of model, we can increase our fidelity. Uh, but we are adding uncertain things, and this has been proved now by Andrea, you know, that uh, the FX, if you don't have good work results, then maybe this is going to be carried out and it's going to be propagated. And, and increasing as well the fidelity of the, of the micro scale, then we need better validations as well, no? because we, we need to be able then to 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 more accurately as well have experimental measures on, on, on with better resolution that when you were comparing with mesoscale models. So this, these are challenges that we need to fix to go further, but as well it, from the micro scale uh, part, we are increasing the meshes. Uh, there is the challenge of doing these meshes with the correct quality because we, we want to follow more details on the topography and we are generating more data, so we you could generate terabytes of data that after you need to post-process in an effective way, no, for the industry after digest that, no, and have the, the all the information in a way that can be useful. And it's not just a huge database that it's at the end useless, no. And this is another challenge, no, how to tackle that in order that at the end. Uh, is not just an exercise, a demonstration of computational capability, is something that at the end uh, has a, a real impact. And this has to be all together. No? We need to do more validations. We need to research on better ways to extract the information. I'm, I'm totally sure machine learning here is helping uh, uh, to, to get a, a better view of what is going on. And, and better ways as well to be more efficient, as Talibor was saying. Uh, in order to be able to run it in in, in times and and in a cost uh, computational but also economical and an electrical cost no that makes sense in order to justify that this is used at the end by the industry and we have several barriers that uh, uh, Neil was saying just to enter to the to the resources no so how industry can access to HPC platforms and uh, generate all this data, uh, run the simulation, no, have the knowledge no, to be able to run this type of complex models and then get the data to the offices and use this data. These, if these models uh, are becoming more and more, we want that these models are used, uh, we need to solve it. And at this moment, uh, this is not that easy, that industry get access to HPC and does 
uh, you know, uh, this type of calculations. Thank you. No, I, I agree with you. Uh, this is one of the topics that uh, I'd like to discuss as well, you know, the access to uh, big computational infrastructure. What would it change? Because now we're seeing that uh, there's a tendency, you know, using supercomputers uh, instead of using like local workstations in your office. I think the, the tendency for the next years is, is, is going to be using large infrastructures. You know, Amazon is doing that. Uh, some others, providers that are there. And, and um, my, my question, uh, for, probably for Dirk, uh, he's, she's got a, a, a really good um, idea of what the industry needs, you know, it's like, uh, do you think people that, that are getting access to these large computational infrastructures would uh, improve the products that uh, you as a consultancy can provide to developers? Or, th or is this something that still needs uh, more time to, to develop? Is this something that you're using now or you think that uh, uh, it needs more uh, research and development? You're, you're muted, uh, the sentence of uh, this year. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I would say it's a an, an hybrid solution, I would say. Uh, I don't think we can, if, if, if we were provided more access to the supercomputing, super what we would do is to test uh, our models or more complex models and use them to learn and create big databases that then we could access easily. Uh, and that's basically what we do now. We, we run our, our CFD or, or other models that we have for like require large computational uh, resources externally. Um, and that's okay as far as that it's a reasonable time of one week time. We cannot, we, we, we cannot uh, allow ourselves to spend more than that. Uh, but then, um, I mean, we have to make a, a, a wise use of that resource. So it's not that uh, the way I see it is not that every time we need to run something on a site, we go and spend resources from this uh, supercomputing and then go back and provide that to a project, to a customer. That's not the way it should be. We should take, because at the end, of, at the end it, it, it will always be limited. It could be improved the access to the supercomputings, but it will it will be limited still. So the use we would do of that is use it, run some or many examples, create databases, and then use some other techniques, the statistical techniques to extract as much as we can from that. And that's how it, it probably will will be like for for many other things. Yes, Not only wind flows. I understand your point of view because the industry usually needs uh, kind of plug and play solutions, something, something easy and yeah. ready to use. Uh, and uh, the access to this infrastructure and the use of these models is usually something really complex and requires a lot of time. And uh, and and this is something something difficult. So I think there's there's some field here for uh, uh, consultancies to do uh, uh, nice work on that and provide easy solutions. Maybe Javier. Can can add uh, a nice view now that uh, he moved to uh, a developer and manufacturer. Maybe you can give us your opinion on this topic. Hmm. So the market the market is not really helping um, bring HPC to or large infrastructures to to industry in the sense that uh, we need to reduce the, the cost of energy. So doing Big investments on HPC is not likely. Uh, so I, I see a, an hybrid approach, as, as they were saying, that like you, you may want to use HPC for, for research purposes and to generate uh, high quality databases that you can then use to calibrate, reduce other models that can, can be used operationally. Uh, so they, these models become more accurate at the same cost than, than before. Um, HPC is also very, very interesting as a like a virtual laboratory where you can test new prototypes or, or innovation. Like, for example, the the whole wind farm control uh, technology has been pretty much developed with HPC using 
LES models before trying this in real conditions because then you can you can test it out uh, quite cheaply compared to of course testing this in the field uh, and once you get a, a good sense of, of that this is going to work then you can start thinking about moving that to a, to a technology so i think we, we can still continue with hpc as, as we have it today i don't see it uh, becoming an operational tool anytime soon but rather i see more and more, and more use of uh, cloud computing because that's really handy and uh, makes life easy for for industries to to access uh, computing but hpc is still is very very expensive and i see it uh, remaining a like a virtual laboratory for for generating uh, high quality data thank you javier uh, andrea your your approach to this problem the coupling was uh, said to be the simplified approach but anyway it requires a lot of computational power as well because of the force computations and so what what do you think about this uh, access to supercomputers would probably improve results or like it is something needed well i i uh, i i see it that uh, well for for the simpler approach actually the the uh, global wind atlas one i think took several months to run um now we can do a haul of new one one afternoon in our cluster in a few nodes so uh, uh you know, both the code has has improved, and the way we couple it uh, has also make it uh, go much faster. Um, but uh, the question is, uh, you know, is is the whole industry ready for all these codes to be there and to use them? Uh, and I'm not, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, that uh, it, it is a good question. I think, um, um, as you can see, I've been running, you know, mesoscale models for 30 years, and I had one setting that I never thought of before. And then suddenly I said, "Oh, why? Why is this one and not two, right?" Uh, and and you wonder uh, about uh, so many other settings that that could have some influence and that we never thought about, right? Um, the only way to to find out is to 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 run more and more cases and and compare to observations, but. Uh, but many times, as uh, Sirsha mentions, uh, you, you know, you got a project, you have a week to to answer, and and, and you have limited resources to to come to with this, right? So it's perhaps the the role of us as researchers to to provide that uh, to the industry. Thank you, Andrea. Dalibor, maybe you want to add some words to this topic. Well, I think uh, in general we will really have. A hard time uh, in competing with the existing uh, like uh, non-dynamical or statistical uh, models uh, if we compare this dynamical coupling uh, to that because it's simply more orders of magnitude difference in the computational time needed to do so 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 the question is i mean how, how much of the this extra uh, information that we can bring about uh, using this approach is valuable for the industry. So for me, that's that's kind of a question. If if there is no interest in that, then maybe uh, fine tuning many of the other models, uh, targeting towards the statistical uh, values, and and I think some of that uh, we are also addressing in this benchmark case uh, of Alaïs, uh, where. Most of us have tried to struggle with producing time series and using, you know, even LES and several weeks of computation. But then we had a, a one uh, group there who, who did everything on a statistical basis, got reasonable results uh, and, and did it like, I don't know, in half an hour or something. So so this is this is something to to consider. So so I mean if I guess there is a need to define uh, what exactly uh, do we need and then try to figure out what which methods are the best to do that. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. Pirte? Yeah, I think in that sense, uh, it is, you mentioned about uh, solving the same thing with a quick statistical method. And it probably, uh, until some point, 
uh, it is enough. Uh, the thing is, what else we will need to, uh, to be answering in the next years that will make it necessary to go farther? And it's not that we run on time series just because we feel it's more accurate. And that shouldn't be the reason at all, because even if there are seasonal or daily profiles or even vertical profiles that are more complicated, that doesn't really mean that on an annual average, it will, the result will change. Uh, so when do we need to go further and, and, and define all this in a, in a more accurate way? And it's only when we have to necessarily look at that. For example, when we look at revenues of wind farms and we don't only look at energy production, when we look at revenues, it's really important to know when and how you are producing. When we look at more complicated control strategies for wind farms, uh, it is really necessary to understand how you're going to make the control because that's going to happen on a, on, a, on a temporal basis. And you can set up a very complicated control strategy if you don't have the, the knowledge to, to predict and, to, and to, to model that, there's no, that makes any sense. So only when we need to answer these sort of, of topics, which were not so relevant some years ago, is when, when it will make a difference. Otherwise, to estimate the annual mean wind speed at some location that could affect that in some sites, I'm, I'm not saying it's not, it will affect and But in general, that's not going to be the, the, yeah, the game changer. Yes, I, I agree with you. And uh, well, let's face that uh, in the near future, the, the future of wind energy, is getting more and more competitive. Uh, and there will be a big growth in the following years. Uh, revenues are decreasing somehow because uh, the sector is becoming competitive. And it's not like, uh, like 10 years ago in which uh, you could install a wind farm and that would uh, give you some uh, money back easily. And now uh, you're gonna have to be like really precise in what you're doing. So in that sense, probably uh, we need tools that are more and more complex. But uh, at the same time, is uh, yeah, and I agree with Fifth, uh, it's difficult because um, of the usually the industry is used to like really simplified tools, no? uh, not wasting much time on doing calculations because uh, uh, it's probably not the role. I mean, developers like my company is not the role no? to do like super complex things, but they're doing things like easily and fast. Uh, so, Oriol, I don't know if you want to add some words on this. I think has been everything covered. I'm in the same boat of Dalibor, so I do the research. So for me, it's interesting itself because all the challenge is that uh, it's making us to solve, no? But of course, we, we collaborate with you, Daniel. I think on this particular question, your opinion is the one that it's valid. I'm, I'm well aware that um, that sometimes it's very difficult no, to, to justify uh, the cost, the, uh, the computational cost, but as well the, the all the other costs, no? That because we we take some time to get the results, uh, because we need to prepare a lot of the case, the measures. Uh, there is a lot of knowledge, no? Uh, on on those models, and then it, it just makes sense on some particular case where uh, these are the values needed, no? So we know perfectly that with Alias we have been discovering with you that. So for some cases that are very dynamic, that we need to know very well the turbulent kinetic energy for particular reasons, then it makes sense. But if not, generally speaking, usually more simple models are, are worth it, no? Mm -hmm. See, I think this is, this is the case for some, for some forensic cases, uh, having a really complex model is useful, but probably for the daily basis cases uh, enough with, uh, with a simplistic approach because uh, it's a reasonable approach to the calculation. So, um, uh, Daniel, I think that Pep Moreno, uh, yeah, wants to to say something because he has the the hand raised. Raised? Oh, I don't see that. So, Pep, yeah, uh, welcome here. Here you are. Yeah, yeah. Hello. I I was not sure if I was allowed to say anything. Uh, but I just tried, okay? So 
I wrote I wrote it in the so thank you for 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 listening um, and and hello to the many I know uh, in 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 the chat. I just wanted to mention that in this debate we we had recently uh, you you probably know that we um, um, started a, 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 an open group on wind resource the the wind resource uh, working group with many participants uh, from the industry uh, and we have open debates there and we had lately a very interesting open debate on the time series if uh, if the industry is prepared to go into the time domain and i uh, myself that i was very convinced on the on the time series for many years because as you may know at vortex we have been um running uh, the Wolf LES in time series for, me, for for a couple of years now. And, and after this debate, it is not so clear for me that um, time series is the, is the paradigm because uh, some, uh, they express their concerns about the time series. And it's true what you are expressing um, about the cost. Uh, we, 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 we run the Wolf LES to deliver one year of data uh, and it takes this about five dates. But this it gives only you a result in one point. So is it worth it? Uh, uh, I don't know. P people is requesting them, but uh, but it's not. Uh, of course, it's not uh, um, the total solution. And and in this debate, very very interesting questions raised. Uh, uh, for example, if how can you uh, ensure long term representativeness with a time series? This, this was a very, and, and this was so interesting that we uh, cascade up these, uh, these concerns to the Wind Europe. And in the next uh, workshop in Wind Europe, there will be a special session on, uh, on, on time series. So I, I really encourage uh, all of you that who, who will attend the workshop of, uh, uh, of Napoli or, or, or online, I don't know how it will be at the end. But to, to attend this session on time series, I think this is an, a non, non, non so clear question and it has yet to be solved. So thank you. Thank you, Pep. Thank you. So uh, regarding that also, uh, something that came to my mind as well is how, how, how far models can go because we are uh, in and around this, this topic. Uh, how, how far models can go? How much do we need? No, it's just uh, simply about the adding physics uh, as we've been doing here. Or, for instance, how, how can help uh, machine learning in these problems? What do you think is the, is the future? Increasing physics and resolution or like uh, using some alternative uh, techniques like machine learning? Uh, Tirte, you done a... um, I mean, I, I don't have a question, uh, an answer for that. I can... I can talk about the, not much, because I don't know much, but I can tell you about our experience with the um, CF, uh, CFD modeling of locked effects and wakes. And uh, that is definitely where uh, something where um, uh, computing can help a lot. And that was a, a huge problem for us because we saw that coupling wakes and wind flow uh, definitely helps a lot, a lot. It even identifies effects that we knew it, they were there, but we were not quantifying, as you all know. So the problem was that that took us a lot of a lot of time for each site to run, uh, as, as much time, and it was so expensive that we couldn't solve it for 90% of the project we were running because the customer was not the was not going to to spend that time and and money on that. So we have applied a machine learning based solution to, so what we have done is what I explained before, we have learned a lot and we have run uh, uh, some, some, some many sites. And based on that, we applied machine learning to do it quicker. So now probably we are not, maybe who knows, but we are not as accurate as if we were running it side by side, but we are very close. And the 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 yeah the the cost of that is much 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 lower. Cost benefit. Yeah. Javier. Yes. Um, 
Am I? Yes. Can you hear? Hear. Okay. Sorry. Yes, I think that's the first thing uh, for which machine learning can be useful. So surrogate modeling uh, to to build uh, fast models out of uh, high fidelity data. I think that's really uh, a powerful technique. Um, I would also like to uh, highlight that if, even if you mess a micro with a, a physics-based approach, the best information you have is still from, from the MedMask that you always have in a project. So you need to find a way to calibrate that uh, model chain with the existing measurements. So over there, you also have some opportunities to build uh, parametric models for, for the error, for the bias that you have in, in, your, in your model chain, which can, can utilize some machine learning. And of course, if you have a large uh, array of uh, measurements, you can start to generalize how these errors behave depending on the terrain complexity or the or the, the turbine uh, configuration uh, and learn from that. So I also expect a lot of um, opportunities by leveraging uh, large databases from from industry. Of course, this is these databases are not open, uh, but of course, if you are working in a it's a big uh, company like Siemens Gamesa, there are of course a lot of opportunities there to to play with uh, machine learning uh, and build this this type this type of models. Yeah, thank you, Fabio. Thank you. Uh, Andrea or Dali uh, would like to add something to this topic. Is it about physics? Is it about using techniques to save some time? Uh, because uh, we have seen that uh, there's still some, and Andrea, I think you were saying exactly that. Uh, sometimes you, we don't know why the same model is failing in some places and in others. And, uh, and it's difficult because there's, uh, we tend to think that is the physics. So we need to have more physical or uh, realistic representation of the physics there. But uh, how, how far can we go with that? Yeah, two, two comments in that direction. One is that, uh, Actually, numerical weather prediction models are going in that direction as well. Um, there's been uh, several theses I have, um, PhD theses that I have actually converted their model physics, you know, boundary layer parameterizations, radiation parameterizations into, into uh, machine learning models, which run much, much faster than any of the physical models. And the, the actual results are very similar. So that's uh, that is a place where where it can can really really help you. Um, the other one is that uh, yeah I think that uh, I have a student working also on trying to to uh, for we've used machine learning for forecasting for for many 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 years. That's the basis for it. We didn't call it that, but but adjusting your forecast for for a site that's what we're doing. Uh, but for resource assessment, uh, once we have data, I think we can we can really go go far and, and identify places where, where things um, are going correctly and places where not, are not going. And the more sites you have, the more you can you can learn from it. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. Alibor? Well, in some sense, this part of machine learning is uh, reminiscent of this uh, method to microcoupling because on a micro level, we are re relying on the information that we have provided by the MESA model to be reasonably accurate. And uh, for this machine learning to work, I guess, uh, we need to think about uh, the basis for machine learning to, to start. So how do we build up uh, a huge uh, basis of cases or whatever we want uh, to build uh, from uh, machine learning to learn from? And that's where like high fidelity models probably uh, come into the play and maybe something connected to the time series as well. So, so for me, there is a, like a, a connection there uh, because just applying machine learning uh, without making sure that what we are learning from uh, is probably questionable. Yeah, so that's what I, my thoughts about this. Thank you, Oriol. Your yeah, yeah. Actually, we are beginning to work a lot on machine learning on on our group for for improving the CFD model, as surrogate models and correction for the turbulence models. 
uh, for instance, on the wall or in runs to 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 modify some of the constants of the of the of the of the runs equations, but instead of using real constants, using functions of some invariants, no, and then you you get a runs that it's you know more general. And so with that, I mean that we will find not just that machine learning, it's, it's going to help a lot on, on industry in order to have kind of reduced models coming from high fidelity, but it's, it's going to help us as well at the modelers at the micro scale and so to improve our models. Now, now we know that a lot of the calibrations that we are using for RANs, for instance, are not for complex terrain. So and we, we can think on ways to improve that uh, thanks to, to machine learning. And as Dalibor was saying, thinking on which experiments no, uh, we need to do from high fidelity in order to, to help the ranch models. And then maybe you have ranch models that are faster than, and you are on a middle ground, no? that you can improve a lot of the tools that now industry is already using. That's a, a clear option I see. And, and as well, to, to as kind of surrogate models no, for the world for this type of mesoscale scale uh, models in order to go to the micro scale. So the other way around no, that most of the presentation we did have. For that, there are challenges because one of the things that uh, you learn depending which machine learning model you use is that uh, the data that you use has to be very similar to the data of the model that at the end where you want to use your machine learning. So th there are several challenges to do that. It's not just to the high fidelity, it's after how we can change this high fidelity data in order to be something that can be used when you are using your mesoscale model. So on that, I see several challenges, but very, but I think it's it's a very interesting, you know, future direction that for sure it's going to reduce, I think, the, the cost of and I hope we can improve the, the, the accuracy no, that we have as well on, on our models. Do you think, Oriol, that this is the, the key challenge you, that you face in your field in the following years, the use of machine yeah. learning? Or there are yeah. other uh, challenges that you think? Uh, well, there are the traditional challenge that is better scalability to adapt you know, the codes to new platforms that they are going to be more powerful, but they they work very different because now we are using too much energy for, per flop, no? So to, to have something that is more ecological, but allows us to increase this, 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 uh, this race to be, to have more power, uh, this is going to be a challenge, but these are more traditional challenges that HPC community has its decade, no? But now with we have this new technology. I think I look at it like a new numerical method that we could include on all our uh, steps, no? Of 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 the framework that we use. That, as Andrea was saying, a lot of time has been already used because machine learning is an umbrella for a lot of different statistical uh, type of approaches. But now we will have uh, a lot of technology because a lot of people is working on that. We will have a specific hardware that works very well on, for, for this type of approaches. And I think that for sure the, in the next generation of, of codes and methodologies, most of them, they are going to be machine learning at some point. Uh, Alibor, for instance, do you think uh, this is a key challenge in your field, uh, the use of machine learning or, or the traditional ones like Rio was saying? Was that a question for me, sorry? Yeah, no, the question is that, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think is the key challenge you face in your in your field in the following years? Because we're speaking about uh, machine learning and the use of uh, uh, these, these techniques. And uh, Oriol was also adding that probably uh, there's the traditional also like uh, challenges of uh, physics. So my question was for you, like uh, what, what do you think is the key challenge you have in your, in your field in the, in the next years? Where do you think, uh, you have to uh, improve no, the knowledge. Well, I'm not. I'm actually not working that much with machine learning myself mm -hmm. uh, for the, for the time being. But I mean, I see the biggest challenge with this machine learning in building up the proper, uh, you know, learning uh, 
database for the machine to, mm -hmm. to learn from. So, so how do we build that uh, in, in a consistent way uh, will depend uh, what kind of result we can expect on the other side, I guess. And, and then, uh, I mean, I also saw that uh, inside WARF, uh, they, they start talking on mesoscale modeling, they start talking about putting a new schemes in, uh, which uh, are not like uh, the traditional ones, but are kind of learning from the results of a similar uh, setups using many of those schemes uh, and, but but there are like challenges with that uh, again you know combining the machine learning with a physical model at some point may it may introduce some unphysical values which are completely off which will blow the simulations uh, completely so so i mean do we rely on machine learning uh, totally at some point or how do we combine that with the uh, existing uh, micro scale model and, and I would be also interested in, uh, in following up on what Oriol is saying. I mean, changing some cost constants in K epsilon model, for example. I mean, you can suddenly introduce by machine learning a value which uh, goes uh, into direction the, the, the other part of the flow solver does not follow and so on. So I think that the, the challenge would be in, in introducing uh, this uh, into the existing flow of uh, uh, the physical modeling in, in a proper way, I guess. Okay, thank you, Dalibor. Um, I think Andrea agrees with you. Uh, that uh, was my impression. Yes, I do, but but, but actually uh, in the numerical water prediction world, um, they, they are starting playing with the, you know, with random parameterizations and things like that, that we, we have not really explored. So, so that creates also not just, you know, a single realization with a time series, but a multiple ensemble of possible realizations for that time series. And, and, and how, what do we do with those? It's still not clear. Um, in NIWA, we try to, to, to do something like that and figure out, okay, if you do an ensemble, then what is the spread of your forecast? And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a clear, a clear relationship, but uh, but that's something that's still still out there and still needs to be resolved. And um, we try uh, an ensemble of multiple parameterizations. But actually, I think that the way to go was to with the with the ensemble of of parameters and not not of parameterizations. But uh, parameterizations have tend to have the wrong way of doing things. And every time you put this, they will do it the same way. And, and once you work with WARF more and more, you see that that's the case. Every time you have these circumstances, that's the profile that WARF will do. Uh, but the atmosphere is perhaps not that way. Um, and there are many random processes that we don't have in it. So, um, so that's another way, uh, something that's a challenge and that's exciting to see, I think, moving into that direction. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, the industry point of view, Firce or Javier, on this uh, topic of the next challenges. Maybe if they already said something no, about uh, using time series, and, uh, but I don't know if uh, to add something else on this question like this. Here. You mean, Daniel, the challenges in relation yes. with the, with the um, machine learning or in general? Yes. Well, uh, it's the challenges in the field. I think probably the challenges in, let's say that uh, I'm in your field as well, I'm in the industry, so uh, probably they're slightly different. There are uh, other stuff as well, apart from the okay. scientific or more technical problems. You know, there are challenges here now that are coupling technologies, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, we, we're facing a, a, or using batteries. It's yeah. one, of, one of the of the next challenges using large batteries for for energy uh, deployment. Uh, so so the question was uh, broad, um, ample, so you can uh, I don't know, uh, answer. Yeah, I think I was going to bring that one as well. Like the hybrid projects we are seeing in many countries, mm -hmm. uh, some in Europe, some outside Europe and inclusion of uh, including uh, batteries and that together with the fact that the the uh, the the grid is being every time more more complicated to manage and also the way projects get revenue or sell the energy 
out there, it's more and more complicated every time. Uh, that will demand that we model many different things with different time resolutions uh, and with some of them being physical, physical models, some of them being social models like the, the demand and all that being coupled together. For me, that's going to be a, a challenge. So right now you have like energy production on one side and then, uh, I don't know, price estimation on the other side and both have come together from different models that yeah have some point of contact some point but that's it while the truth is that they are completely re related to each other and also related to the to the future climate which is also has a huge uncertainty on that and probably um yeah like climate change has been modeled separately from all the other while it has an impact as well so that's my feeling like we have, we've got time series or not even time series we have results from from some realities uh, coming from different models some of them being physical some of them not some of them having uh, a lot of assumptions most of them being very very inaccurate and they all come together to provide the yeah answers and for me that's a challenge Thank you, Peter. Javier, uh, you also wanted to comment something. Yes, and actually, surprisingly, I'm, I'm again agreeing with Circe that the, the main challenge is not going to be on CFD or meso microcoupling, is, is that we are moving towards a more and more system integration. Uh, we need to take care of uh, the value of, of energy more and more. Uh, not just the cost. So we think we are moving towards uh, integrating wind systems with uh, other renewable energies and storage. And in the end, you are you need to combine a lot of models together. So it becomes um, complicated just to connect, interconnect all these models and, and to run optimization based on so many parameters. So when you're moving to, to this uh, scenario, I, I don't want to say that it becomes irrelevant to think about meso micro copy, but uh, let's say it has uh, less of a of, of a weight compared to the holistic approach that you are you are trying to to address. Uh, in that context, you need to run a lot of models, a lot of times, and and also think about uncertainties. So uncertainty quantification becomes also very very, very important. And, and of course, we are moving towards more, more and more uh, sensors being connected from all these systems. So how to assimilate all that data to build uh, these uh, simple models that can run very efficiently in the cloud. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's all a very big uh, challenge. Uh, and it's very fascinating to move in that direction. That's a huge challenge, Javier. The, uh, the measurements and the treatment we make of all the data we'll, we, we will get and combine them with models. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very good one. Hmm. I agree on that point as well. Uh, we have a comment from the audience uh, saying that as long as wind industry is not ready to spend more for decent resource assessments, heavy approaches have not likely to succeed easily. Uh, uh, this is what we are discussing here. So. Uh, in this case, this uh, of our listeners uh, advocates for uh, for more and more uh, use of uh, our res computing resources. So that would be one solution. Okay, uh, I think we are coming to an end uh, today. I don't know if you all want to add like uh, some last words since you didn't say anything in this last turn. No, I, I would like to thank everybody. To yeah. come because it has been a very interesting uh, webinar, I think. Uh, I have enjoyed a lot the the the, the others uh, presentations were very interesting, and that's it. Thank you, everybody. And mm. I think the discussion as well it, it was enriching because some we are put researchers or they come from industry, and it's it's always to see these different opinions, no. 
No, I agree. Before we go, I would like to add that uh, I think there's a survey for you if you can take just uh, some more time to to fill in the survey that uh, I think we will send through the chat, or if not, I think we probably get uh, to you on on an email. And apart from that, uh, it's been a great pleasure. I would like to really thank all of the participants, I mean, the presenters, because uh, I know we, uh, it's, uh, well, there's time me forward of being here and preparing the presentation and then discussing with us. So really, thanks to you all. And thanks to all of the people that have attended the, the meeting. And I don't know, I think that is uh, almost everything. I think it's been all super interesting, as Solio was saying. And I hope to see you soon in one of the physically, like uh, uh, seeing each other in reality instead of uh, using these tools like Zoom or so. I hope to see you really soon, and so we can uh, go on discussing these these topics, which are really really interesting. So thank you very much to all of you. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. It was thank a you. pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you also from thank my you. side. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.